recording. All right, we're live. Welcome everybody to this Dev Shop Marketing Briefing. Um, thanks for being here. It, if you came here live, you've got the opportunity to ask questions of my guest expert, Liston Witherill. Liston has um, a super interesting background, but one of the things that he's uh, good at and has had a lot of success with is partnering with people who already have an audience to uh, sort of siphon off, I guess you could say, some of their audience. Um, and this is a really valuable technique because I, I think there's not a lot of things that are more difficult than um, building an audience totally from scratch. So this is a sort of a shortcut, a sort of accelerator that, um, you know, a method for getting people who are interested in and paying attention to whatever it is you're doing and from that, you can often quickly move into building trust and a sales conversation. So that's what Liston's gonna talk about. Um, and if you have questions, I hope that you will ask them by dropping them in chat and then we'll run them past Liston at the end. We're all here in the same room. So when we get to your question, um, feel free to just chime in with a follow-up or a clarification or whatever it is. Uh, that'll make things more interesting, I think, for everybody. Uh, you don't have to do that, but just know that that's why I set these meetings up this way, is so that there's potential for lots of sort of interaction rather than you being kind of behind a, a digital, you know, curtain and you can't really talk with us. So I think that's about it. We've got up to 90 minutes here. Um, if we need that much time for Q&A, um, listens here for, for the rest of that time. And I think that's it. So listen, uh, with that, I'm going to mute myself okay. and uh, turn things over to you. Let me um, spotlight your, I don't know. No, I don't think I want to make you a host. Let me spotlight your video. And um, yeah, man, take it away. All right, wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. And... Let and that watch. looks great. We can see that. Yep. You guys got that? Yeah, perfect. Uh, um, okay. One second here. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, Philip, thank you for inviting me to do this. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. And, um, you know, I, this is a presentation I've given before. Um, every time I give it, some new things come up for me and the people who see it. And so just to echo what Philip said, um, we, we have about 90 minutes and my hope, my biggest hope really, is that this is gonna get the gears turning for you as you watch it. And so if you have any questions, make sure you save those up, put them in chat as you think of them, that's totally fine. And there will be plenty of time. My presentation is only gonna be about half the session and then the remaining 45 minutes will be dedicated to your questions. Um, they can either be about exactly what we're talking about or if you have any sales related questions, um, I'll get to why I'm qualified to answer those, but you can ask those as well. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Um, so if you're here to see how to build an audience and get referrals without spending a penny, you're in the right place. Um, if not, hang out with me. I'm a pretty cool dude and so is Philip. Um, uh oh, hang on. Does that work? Okay, sweet. Um, so I wanted to take a second uh, just for you to kind of introduce yourselves um, in the chat. Can you say who you are and maybe uh, just where you are in the world? And Philip, I'm going to rely on you to uh, read these off because uh, Keynote takes over my entire screen, so I have a hard time. I don't know. You might be relying on the wrong guy. I'm pretty unreliable. <laughs> I have <laughs> faith in you. I have so, faith. Don't let me down. So we've got Ari, who's in Richmond, Virginia. Tristan from Ger in Germany today. Holy cow. But I think Tristan, based on his accent, lives in the UK. Or uh, that's my guess anyway. Josiah from LA. Dave from Chicago-ish. Scott Jacob from Denver, Colorado. And uh, Michael. Um, let's see. Michael, I forget where you live. Um, East Coast somewhere, I think. Stafford, Virginia. There we go. Mm. 
Martin from Vancouver, BC. Um, Tristan's normally in Brighton, so I'm not uh, not that much of an idiot when it comes to accents. <laughs> David, uh, oh my gosh, David lives, I'm going to guess, less than 50 miles from me in Napa Valley. I'm over in Sebastopol, David. Nice to meet somebody who's semi-local. All right, so it looks like that's that's who's here listening. That's who is scrutinizing your every word, um, paying rapt attention to what you have to say. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all for uh, sharing a little bit. So my name's Liston and I live in Portland, Oregon, where it is gray and rains a lot, but the winters are pretty mild. Um, and what I do is I help freelancers and consultants sell with confidence. Um, we can kind of get into what that means later, but what I really want to share with you today are two strateg strategies to build your audience, whether they're large or small. And the reason you may be here is you've thought something like this before. I could help so many people if I could just reach them. And if you thought that, so did every other consultant and freelancer ever. So you're not alone. So the question is, what do you do about that? What is the, the right step to take in order to address this problem of you being helpful and having something that you know people need and want, but actually reaching them? making them aware that that's something that you can do for them. Um, they know who you are, they know what your services are, they know what your point of view is, um, and they, they know how to get a hold of you. How do you do it? So that's the big question, what do we do about this? And of course, you've heard this before, go build an audience. And the advice seems really simple. Yeah, of course, I'm gonna go build an audience, but as you kind of dig into it, what does that mean? And you've probably heard things like this, go out and write a blog and create a ton of content, promote what you make on social media. If you're going to be on social media, create custom graphics, be yourself, inject your personality and humor into every single post. Do that five times a day. Get zillions of readers while you're in the process. Get all of them onto your email list, get your subscribers, then build fancy email marketing and drip campaigns and on and on and on. But my question for you is as you look at this as a solo person or a small shop, do you even have time for that? I mean, if you've gone through this process, you've probably wondered, okay, what are the three things I can do off of this list? Because this is the list that we see everywhere, right? Everybody who's promoting um, their own marketing system or their, their way of building a funnel, you know, go build a funnel and all your problems are solved. And so if you tried it, you may have thought that this is what was going to happen. Hockey stick growth, right? You're like a SpaceX rocket taking, up, taking off into the stratosphere and, you know, within weeks or months, you see these huge profits rolling in and it's all paying off. But probably the growth you actually saw if you were building your audience like this is more like a paddle boat. And there's a lot of reasons, but one of them is we were told falsely by a lot of people that if you build it, they will come. If you create your marketing content, if you start to try to attract an audience and do all those things that I was talking about through content and social media and email and all the rest, if you build it, they will come. And what actually happened probably looks a little bit more like a tree falling in the forest, right? You're wondering, did that actually happen? So what's going on? What's causing this? Because HubSpot, for instance, built their entire business model on promoting this idea. And it's the dominant idea that I hear in marketing. Start blogging, people will show up, all your prayers will be answered, right? Um, so what's going on? 2.7 million. Who has a guess about what this number means? 2.7 million. This is one of the things that's causing you all of these problems. Take a second, pop your answer into the chat. I'm curious to hear what people think. 2.7 million. Why is this number causing you to fail at building an audience? Philip, I'm relying on you here. Is that how many times you have to get rejected before you make your first sale? <laughs> Thankfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here are some, um, 
some, I think, pretty good guesses coming in from the audience. Uh, David says uh, new like pieces of content per day, uh, blogs, is it blogs, blog posts per hour, number of times Trump tweets every day, <laughs> which, you know, it's, which, which of these is it? Let's, let's go ahead and uh, resolve the mystery here. Yeah, so blog posts. So this was the number of daily blog posts as of 2015. My guess is in 2018, I don't have the current data, my guess is it would be at least double this number now. So as we create more stuff, as tempting as it is, this build it and they will come thing is not going to work because there's millions and millions of other people doing that, right? And a lot of companies are um, creating huge amounts, huge volumes of content and ideas. And as an individual or as a small shop, it's impossible to keep up with that. So here's another problem. This is you, right? You're an entrepreneur, you're a solopreneur, you're a consultant, a freelancer, however you consider yourself. You are trying your best to promote big ideas and do great work for your clients. Who are you competing against when you try to build an audience? Well, you're competing against someone like Molly. Molly Pittman is the VP of Marketing and Digital Marketer. She manages millions of dollars of Facebook ad spend every month, and she's an SEO expert. As you endeavor, if you're a marketing consultant, you're actually competing directly with Molly in a lot of ways. It's not fair, the game is rigged. You're also competing with this guy, Neil Patel another marketing expert if you're in marketing services. So whatever your thing is, it's very likely that people will have dedicated experts trying to beat you and people like you and rise to the top of that 2.7 million every day, right? So you probably feel like this and you're competing against this huge team of people who are trying to rise to the top. And so what building an audience takes is time, and money and know-how, right? It's, it's three things. It's not just one thing, time, money, and know-how. So we know we're short on time. We know we can't spend an infinite amount of money on promoting our content. And we probably don't know quite as much as some of these marketing experts who we're competing against. Now, I do want to make a quick side note about the term audience. So. What I mean by audience isn't necessarily thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. For you, the perfect size audience may be 20 people, right? That's fine. As I think about the economics of what it means to be a consultant or a service provider, often all we need is a few clients a year to really make rain. Um, if you know who Blair Ends is, he suggests never to have more than eight clients in a year. I have coaching clients who only have one client at a time and maybe one or two a year. And that is plenty for them because they take on long-term engagements. So when you think about audience, your audience, it really can be any size. It just needs to be the right size and it needs to contain the right laser targeted people. So you might be wondering, is there good news in this presentation? Yes, don't worry, there is good news. And the first thing I want to talk to you about is the opening act strategy. And I'm gonna tell you what that means. But first, does anybody know the name of this band? Go ahead and drop it in the chat. The name of this band. Is that the Backstreet Boys? Close, close, <laughs> Philip. But I see where your head's at. Um, we don't have any guesses yet. We have no and guesses. Or did I lose everybody? No, no. People are. I, I can see people are thinking. There's smoke coming out of some ears. Uh, oh, Creedence Clearwater Revival is a guess. Um, interesting guesses. You and Philip. Philip. <laughs> I'm the dog. Philip, the guy with the straw hat. Uh, America. America. Is it, do you remember them? No, I don't. Uh, they were, uh, I don't know how famous or not famous they were, but uh, less famous than CCR. Let's say okay. that. <laughs> Cream is another guess. That, that is a good guess because they share a common band member, but it's not Cream. This is Derek and the Dominoes featuring Eric Clapton. So I had no idea who this was either. 
Um, the reason that I asked the question though is uh, they, we don't, we don't know who they are, but maybe we know this next person. Any guesses on who this is? Come on, we know <laughs> someone. Dina, thank you. Yeah, David, the, thank you. The, Scott, thank you. The responses right. are coming in 10 times as fast. Philip Philip after, after a sale. sale. <laughs> now, those are Philip's victory glasses. So uh, you're right about that, Michael. So this is Elton John, obviously. And on December 4th, 1970, Elton John opened for Derek and the Dominoes. Now, granted, Derek and the Dominoes had Eric Clapton as a band member, but the point here is that we all know who Elton John is. We have no idea who Derek and the Dominoes are, but Derek and the Dominoes headlined that show on December 4th, 1970. There are other people who opened shows before they were headliners who you may recognize. The Beatles, The Doors, Taylor Swift, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Justin Bieber, basically anybody who's uber famous now opened for someone else early in their career. Now, oh, we, Michael says Maiden used to open for Priest. I don't, is that Iron Maiden? See, I, Iron Maiden is more famous now than Judas Priest is okay. now, I think. You're testing my limits, Michael. I, this is not my area of expertise. But what I want you to take away from this is I want you to be the opening act. So I want you to say this with me. I will not create my audience from scratch because you don't need to. What you can do instead is be the opening act for a headliner who already has an audience. I'm going to tell you how to do that and give you an example of how this applies to business. So when I think about why be the opening act, your audience already exists out there. The headliner has gone to the trouble of building the audience you want access to. So you can access the same audience. You develop a relationship with the headliner. You can go on tour. In other words, like I'm doing right now, I have my opening act, which is very meta, the opening act webinar, and I can take this other places and show it to new audiences, right? You don't have to build your audience from scratch. You really do not have to build your audience from scratch. So it's not about producing tons of content and hoping people show up to you. It's producing some of your best ideas and then taking them to where the audience already is and helping the headliner. And I can give you another example of how I'm doing this recently if anybody wants to know. So this is the key question. Who can I help and how can I help them? So I, I'm a marketer and a sales guy and I love models. So I wanna show you a model. So here's a giant audience. Your headliner is bigger and more known than you are and you're way out on the periphery, right? You're not even orbiting this group of people yet. But in the opening act strategy, you get to be part of this equation. You get to play for the headliner. And so I want to demonstrate now how I took this exact strategy and made it work. So case study number one. So there's a company called Outreach and what they sell is a sales software. Basically it allows salespeople to get more communications out more consistently. So they can drive up their volume of leads through more phone calls and more emails. They're the market leader in this space. They get 270,000 visitors per month. They are the market leader in their category and they had the perfect audience for a company called Sales DNA. So here's outreach. They have a huge email list, tens and tens of thousands of people. They get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people visiting their website every month. Their audience, the audience that we wanted for Sales DNA is salespeople and sales leaders, right? They're already paying attention to what outreach has to say. At the time, outreach thought, we should be doing more webinars. So they had this relatively new program that they needed to get off the ground and no content to help them do it. So they're expanding their content program. They deliver great info to their customers, which is why they have their audience's attention. 
And what they really needed is to convert subscribers into demos. And webinars were one way to help them do that. So what does the audience want? Simple. They just want to be more awesome at sales. They're salespeople and sales leaders. They want to meet or beat their quotas. And they want better ways of doing their job. That's it. So here's this company called Sales DNA. Um, Josh Braun runs it. And the goal of Sales DNA is to make salespeople more awesome, right? So across the board, Sales DNA, the audience, and, and outreach all have the same goal, which is to make salespeople more awesome. Sales DNA also had a big need, which is to get in front of a bigger audience. So you can see here, there's a lot of criteria, but they're all lining up perfectly. And so what I did, this is the process I recommend, is I started small, and I'll show you what that means in a second. I looked for more ways to help outreach. I developed new relationships within outreach, and then ultimately all along I was looking for a win-win. So ask yourself, how do I make users or people more awesome? This is the key right? We need to think about what our audience wants and what the opening act wants. Once we figure that out, we need to figure out how can we actually deliver that to both parties. So how can I make people more awesome? So I'm going to give you step by step exactly how I created a relationship with outreach and what it's done for Josh. So the first thing is I reached out to uh, Mark and Mark is the VP of sales. He is the perfect person that I needed to talk to at Outreach. I reached out to him and I did my homework and I said, hey, I see you're using Chorus, which is a call review software to boost your sales team's performance and help them on their calls. Also, we're demoing Outreach right now and absolutely love it. It's absolutely Krillin, <laughs> which is something, it's a reference to Mark's LinkedIn page. Um, and then I asked him, will you be on my podcast to talk about how he coaches reps and AEs, account executives? It's only 30 minutes. Next thing I know, Mark schedules. I uh, uh, interview Mark. We record it. I publish it on October 5th. Um, and then I started reaching out and asking uh, if I could write articles for outreach. And I said, hey, I got Mark on the podcast based on how I use outreach, your tool. What if I wrote an article about how I did that? And they said, I love this. Yes, please write that article. So I posted that article. Then I said, you know what? We've been writing a lot about how to keep a prospect's attention. Um, would you like an article on that? They said, yes. So this is me starting small podcast, couple articles. Then I said, hey, do you ever do webinars? And they said, yeah, actually, we're trying to do more of those right now. And I said, great, we have a webinar on how to start conversations with strangers without being too salesy. And they said, we would love that. Okay, so we do the webinar for them. Now, this is the win-win, right? Here's that webinar landing page. 450 registrants, 150 people attended, and sorry about that, 450 registrants, 150 people attended, and I got the complete list of who was there and who wasn't there. And we remarketed to the 300 people who didn't come and did another webinar for about 75 people. Those all got added to our list. And I think what's more important here is this idea of repeat wins. So one thing you notice is I created a relationship with Outreach. Now they know Liston, they know Josh, right? They know what we're capable of producing. They know their audience has demand for the content that we're giving them. And the content that we're giving them was exactly on message to what Josh was providing. So we got all these repeat wins. So now there's three, art, three or four articles of ours that are published on Outreach. That gives us backlinks to our site and access to a new audience links to content upgrades. Josh has now done a second webinar with Outreach where he got about 12 meetings the second time. And so once you're accepted, 
you're just going to do it again and again and again. And this is why it's critical to pick the right partners, if you can, from the start, because you're going to form a relationship. So when you think about doing a bunch of podcasts, the nice thing about a podcast is it's fast. You can say the same thing over and over again, and you get access to new audiences all the time. The downside is that you don't have repetition built into a podcast. So if you go on to a podcast, basically that person's only going to want you there once or maybe once a year or once every two years, right? You're going to have to form a new relationship all over again. The nice thing about what I'm suggesting here for building your audience is not only can you go somewhere where they have a big audience that you can access, but there's the opportunity to keep doing more because they need to feed the content beast and you of course can help them do that. So here's the opening act model. The headliner provides the audience, you perform, and there's several ways you can do that. So there's articles or guides, there's checklists, um, there is podcasting or audio recordings, video of course, and then longer form stuff like eBooks or maybe even webinars, right? So there's lots of ways that you can implement this. Now, I do know that some of you, your audience is so sufficiently small that this doesn't make sense to do, right? And you're gonna have to be the judge of that, but I wanna give you an example of what to do if that's the case. What if the audience that you want doesn't self-identify in any way whatsoever? So Philip talks about horizontal or vertical positioning. Um, one way that I look at marketing myself is based on identity. So I talk about I serve freelancers and consultants. That's an identity, a way that you describe and identify yourself. What if you can't check any of those boxes, right? Or what if those people are not accessible that you want access to? That's strategy number two, the gatekeeper strategy. So why use the gatekeeper strategy? And the reason is really simple. There are gatekeepers who hold the keys. So this is also a great referral strategy if you're looking to generate more leads, especially inbound leads or more organic leads. But gatekeepers hold the key. So they have a small marketer audience. The audience is difficult to find and or access. But this audience is already in the orbit of another group of people, and that group is the gatekeepers. And there's a multiplying effect on each relationship, especially the connectors, the gatekeepers themselves. So quick aside here, I want to talk to you about how networks work, right? Um, I've been asked several times, how do you build a professional network? And the answer is slowly, and it's a ton of work. Um, so this is a couple months ago, this was my, the number of LinkedIn connections I had. Um, you can probably add connections at a clip if you're really diligent of about 100 a week, if you need to grow your network. But I have 2,025 first degree connections, right? Let's say each of my connections on average was connected to 500 more people. And my third degree connections, the people my second degree connections are connected to, they each had 500. So now my network is 506 million people, right? Obviously ridiculous. I can't serve that number of people. But the point is, as you connect to these gatekeepers, they're likely to know many more people that you want to know. And some of the people that they know are other gatekeepers, which can introduce you to more people. I know this is a little abstract, so I'm going to make it real for you in a second. But I also want to recommend this movie, Supermensch. So one thing to know about the way networks work is there are a few people called connectors who are connected to orders of magnitude more people than others. As we make our network, we don't know who these people are usually, right? They're hard, it's hard to know externally who's going to have the biggest multiplying effect. But generally, I found in my career, only a few people make an outsized difference. And so this guy, Shep Gordon, this movie is called Supermensch. It's available on Netflix. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Here are some of Shep's clients. 
Blondie, Luther Vandross, Pink Floyd, Emeril Lagasse, Wolfgang Puck. So not only did Shep Gordon manage lots of people in music, but because he was such a super connector, he also made the celebrity chef. He was the first guy to do that as a manager. So Shep would be a good gatekeeper to know if you wanted to be connected to entertainers, right? Maybe that's not your jam. Let's look at another graphic. The gatekeeper strategy. So this is how it works. There is a person who holds the relationship to the people that you want to meet. Let's say your audience is only 50 or 100 people, right? Maybe you need to know five gatekeepers who each know 10 to 20 people. So each gatekeeper, there's going to be some overlap in who they know and how they control that access. So let's make this real with a really concrete example. So I want you to meet Samantha. Samantha is the owner of a company called Red Zest Design. Now, what Red Zest Design does is custom presentations and graphic design for TEDx speakers specifically. So if you've heard of TED, Ideas Worth Spreading, it's a series, it started as a single conference where some of the world's leading experts in different fields will come and talk about whatever their thing is, right? How to have a better marriage, um, why we don't sleep well at night, but like on and on, all of these kind of big questions and sometimes existential questions. TED's become such a big brand that they also have TEDx now, which is a bunch of local events where local people will come and speak about whatever it is that they're working on. So there's a lot of TEDx speakers the problem is you, Sam doesn't always know who those TEDx speakers are because the TEDx events are done by private organizers and those private organizers don't always do a good job of listing the speakers ahead of time. So if Sam wants to make more relationships with TEDx speakers and she wants to get them in time to help them with their presentation, Sam obviously needs access to her gatekeepers, which are the event organizers. So at any given event, this is the structure, right? So think, of, think about if, if you have a small audience and there's some sort of structure whereby gatekeepers are granting access, in Sam's case, it's the event organizers. They're the ones contacting all of the speakers, arranging those speakers to talk, and it's up to them to help their speakers succeed. So one event organizer may know seven different speakers or 10 different speakers. It depends on the size of the event. Now, my question to Sam was, when I was helping her with this, was do the, TED, the TEDx speak, uh, sorry, do the TEDx event organizers ever get together? Yes, they do. And they get together for a conference called TED Fest. And it's in April of this year. And I said, you're going, right? And she said, yes. So the next question was, how can she leverage these gatekeepers that she already knows and new ones that she wants to meet in order to drive some referrals and start to build her audience of TEDx speakers? So we put together a plan. This, in case you haven't noticed yet, I love plans and I love bullet lists. So that's what we did. We put together a plan. The first question is always, how can I be helpful to these people? So whenever we're doing any, anything that's related to lead generation, and Philip does an amazing job of this, Philip is always asking, how can I help the people who I want to do business with, right? How can I make something useful for them? What can I do to make their life easier or make them badass and more awesome at what they do? So that was our first question. How can Sam help with these people? The next question, and I call this the leftover strategy. I don't want to muddy the waters, but your, your strongest connections are the people you already know. So we determine how Sam's going to help them. And then the next step is to reconnect with the organizers she already knows, right? because we're gonna ask them for referrals. They know other people who, we, who Sam wants to know, 
And then she's going to connect in person with them at TED Fest. So let's go to number one. How is Sam going to help them? Well, the question was, what kind of help do organizers need that you're in a unique position to offer? Well, of course, organizers want to make their event more awesome. Well, what does that mean, right? Well, speakers need help. Often people who come and speak at a TEDx event, they don't, they're not seasoned speakers. They're good at a thing, but they don't know how to speak. They don't know how to put together a presentation. They don't know how to hold attention for 45 minutes. So speakers need a lot of help. And one of the areas where they need a lot of help is with the design and the look of the slides. And so I said to Sam, well, what if you created a checklist for the organizers and they could pass that checklist on to the speakers and the speakers would know how they can make their speech more successful. How long should it be? How do you connect the different topics? What do I need for design? And then secondly, she could give them a template. Hey, here's a pre-designed template. And if your speakers just dump their information on here, there'll be a consistent look across the different speakers for your event. Would that be interesting to you? So that's the way she can help these event organizers. She came up with an, another idea since I put this presentation together, and that is to give an email course that drips out over time that she would sell to the organizers and they would give to the uh, speakers. And so over, the, say, the course of two weeks, she would walk them through some best practices of putting together a kick-ass TEDx talk. So this is what it looked like. We determined how to help them. Step number two, reconnect and refer. And this is what the email looked like that I wrote for Sam. Hey, Scott, who's a TEDx organizer, I'm getting excited for the upcoming TED Fest event. Will I see you there? Just curious, do you know any other organizers headed to the event? I only ask because I want to make sure to talk to anyone you think is awesome, Sam. Very short, very to the point. She already has a relationship with these people, so we don't need to kill them with formality, right? Now she gets a positive response. We have a plan for that. Thanks, Scott. If you're up for it, could you send a mutual intro email to the person you recommended? You can just copy and paste this text. So we're making it very easy for them to make a referral or an introduction. Now, if she gets that referral, we have a plan for that too, right? This whole thing is planned out ahead of time. So after the intro, she says, hey, Dustin, I'm getting excited for the upcoming TED Fest event. Will I see you there? Just curious, would you like to meet up at the event? I've worked with Scott, client reference, I've worked with Scott at TEDx to help him put on a stunning event, and I'd love to share some ideas with you. You can take them for free or just pretend you like them, Sam, right? So a little bit of humor and permission to not use Sam's stuff. Number four, connect in person, right? This is the last part of the plan. So as you think about how to connect with people in person, one important thing you might try is this have you ever. So I'm, I'll give you an example for Sam. So when you go to a networking event, um, you're going to hear the question, what do you do? This is one of the easiest questions to stump a person with because they'll often tell you uh, the, like what they actually do throughout the day. And unfortunately, people don't really care about that. So instead of just saying, instead of Sam saying, for instance, I'm a graphic designer, she's, she's meeting these organizers. So she's going to make it relevant to them. So they're going to say, what do you do? Sam's going to say something like, well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever put on an event and noticed that the speakers were totally unprepared for their talk and they had no idea what to do and you couldn't support them? Yeah. Okay. And did you not know where to turn for help in order to make every speaker kick ass when they go up on stage? No, I didn't. Well, that's exactly what I do. I help, sp I help speakers and organizers put on great events and give great talks. So I want to thank Josh Braun for this, the guy from Sales DNA. Um, this, this is something that he picked up from someone else at a networking event. And another question is, after that, when you meet someone, you can ask, would it be helpful if... Would it be helpful if I sent you 
an email course that I put together that you could pass on to your speakers, right? Because so now we want to be in a relationship with people. And then we want to get their contact info. So in terms of the two different types of things we can do, one is the gatekeeper strategy. If your audience is already being held um, by gatekeepers, but they're pretty small and they're hard to access, then, you know, we want to meet and help people with access to your market audience, right? Now, in terms of the opening act, when is the right time to use the opening act? The right time is if you can perform directly for an audience that's already developed by a headliner. These two things are not mutually exclusive, right? We can do them together. I do them together all the time. Um, and in fact, sometimes you can combine forces. So here's what I want you to take away from this, and then we're gonna jump into your questions. I think I'm hitting the 45 minute mark almost exactly. So three key takeaways. This is how you can get started now. I challenge you to start thinking, who is the first question? Who can you help? How can you help them? And then contact one single person, just one, one single person who you can help and see if they would like your help. So I don't want you to think about this in terms of creating a gigantic list. Every relationship and especially every network or every audience starts with one person. So I want you to contact, contact that single person as soon as you identify them and don't worry about it being perfect. I give you permission to send shitty outreach <laughs> because what I've learned is it's much more important to do something and have it be wrong than to do nothing and have it be perfect. So that's, that's my uh, little closing pep talk for you. Uh, I couldn't resist. If you want help with this, you can go to listen.io slash opening act. And there's a guide there that you can download um, that walks you through how to start putting your list together. Um, and, you know, kind of what you're going to say and how you're going to be helpful. And then you, by the end of that worksheet, you would have a complete strategy to move forward in implementing the opening act. And without further ado, I think, um, Philip, we can uh, take some questions here. Man, you just, you made it right under the wire list and the cane was about to come out and um, grab you by the neck and sweep you off the stage. Like the Apollo. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. I'm just kidding. That was, that was great. Thank you. So let me um, work through some questions. I've kind of built up a backlog of questions that folks have submitted through great. the chat window. And I just want to remind you that when, it, when I get to your question, if you want to, uh, you know, like unmute and dive in and, you know, ask follow up questions or add nuance or just anything like that, I really welcome that. I think that's going to make it more interesting and fun for everybody. Yep. Uh, you don't have to do that, but just, just know that you're welcome to do that. So listen, maybe this is covered in your guide. You said, and this is a question for me, um, reach out to one person. And you also said, figure out who you can help. I felt like what I wanted to know more about was what type of person are we talking about a gatekeeper or an audience owner? Is that who you're encouraging us to take action to reach out to? Yeah, exactly. So okay. um, I, I wouldn't start with the strategy. The, I, I do genuinely mean who is the only question at first. Right. So I'll give you an example, Philip. So, um, you know, I, with, with Sam, the obvious question for who or the obvious answer for who was, okay, she wants to help speakers, right? She's worked with dozens and dozens of, the, here, I'm going to stop feel like I want to see you, Philip. Can we both be on screen, by the way? No, no, but I think it'll switch back and forth between whoever's um, talking the loudest or most annoying. <laughs> well, that's always me, of course. Um, uh, so, you know, I think the first question is really, um, you know, for Sam, it's, well, obviously it's the speakers, right? Because she's worked with dozens of them already, she can help more TEDx speakers. The so, so for her, the answer was obvious. That's who she wanted to focus on in her business. That's who she, who she had help, uh, sorry, experience helping in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, the next question is, what can I do for them? Obviously, make their talk better. 
Then the next question is, okay, how do I reach them? Ah, right, now our strategy comes into place. She can't just go find a headliner who's organized a giant thing, except for that TED Fest. So what Sam needs to do is angle to go give a talk at TED Fest next time, because that is where her audience of organizers is. But I think the who part comes down to two things. One is how are you positioned in your business, right? So for me, I'm positioned to help freelancers and consultants sell with confidence. Who has that audience? Well, you do, Philip, right? So I know all, I can- All of it. I have the whole audience, all freelancers. You I'm have kidding. all- So this is the last <laughs> webinar I ever have to do, right? <laughs> no, but your point, I mean, that's an interesting nuance, which is that you, you're not maybe tar- starting at the, at the top of the pyramid, right? You're kind of starting at a level that's not- I mean, who has the biggest audience of freelancers in the world, would you guess? Uh, I've been trying to answer that question. That's a really good question. And I actually, it's hard to tell. Um, yeah, it's not publicly available information. Um, we don't know. But I mean, there's a couple of people like, I don't know, maybe somebody like Ramit Sethi has a massive audience of people who are sort of freelancers, right? Yeah, I was also thinking of um, QuickBooks and FreshBooks probably have very large freelance audiences yeah. as well. Yeah. So do you have to have your positioning before you use this method? Um, so with, oh, actually, sorry, I'm skipping ahead, aren't I, Philip? I was just answering the, the latest question. Well, yeah, hit that question real quick. I, I'm keeping track. I'm, I'm putting a little check mark. I've got a backlog. So um, we'll get to everybody's question um, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll kind of take over with navigating us through. But why don't you hit that question since you brought it up, Liston? Yeah. So um, thank you, Josiah, for asking that. Um, the short answer is it's a lot more effective if you have it. Um, if you've been following Philip, and I can tell you firsthand, I've seen such an acceleration in my marketing and sales since I publicly positioned myself. Um, and the advantage, of course, once you position, is you get inertia, right? You learn more. You reach more people in this exact audience. They know other people who are in the audience. Like there's lots of benefit for doing that. In all sales and marketing, there's this chicken or the egg problem though, right? You want to have everything perfect, but it never is. So should you not do anything? My answer to that is definitely no. You want to put in enough thought to where you have an educated guess about where you need to be and then start pursuing it because it's going to take some time for you to position yourself both from a um, kind of rational standpoint, who's best, what's the open market, um, but also from an emotional standpoint, like, I don't know, am I ready for this? Um, I may be turning down all these other people. So both sides of that are important. But what I would say is, you know, with positioning or anything else that we do in our business, there's this real urge to make it perfect. And I think what's behind that is trying to eliminate risk and uncertainty, but it's not possible to completely do that ever. So I would encourage you, if you have a good idea of who it might be, go after them. If you do a webinar or whatever it is that you do and it doesn't work out, you're going to learn from it. You're going to learn what's a better fit for me in the future. And so I'm a big believer that very few things in selling or marketing are failures. And the reason I believe that is you're always going to learn something that you can apply to the next thing you choose to do. So listen, I've got a question about that. Um, I I like this analogy of a dog sniffing another dog's butt. Uh (laughs) So um, (laughs) when you reach out to a gatekeeper or someone who has a big audience, are they going to kind of sniff your butt by looking at your website to see if you look credible or if your positioning matches their audience. You know, do you know what I'm getting at? I do. Yeah. So um, I have a really long article on the opening act that walks through all of this. If, if anybody here is interested in reading that, you can just go to my site and then click the articles tab at the top. Um, but the answer is yes, right? There needs to be a sufficient amount of overlap between you and your headliner. And they want, they want to see some sort of proof that you're not gonna bomb, right? Because they're taking a risk. We all have a certain amount of social capital in our business. And when we spend it, 
we, we have less in the bank, right? So if Philip brought me on here and I gave a really crappy webinar, you're less likely to come to the next one. Hopefully you're not left with that impression, but that is the case, right? So you're going to want to put your best foot forward and demonstrate to the headliner why they're not taking a risk on you. Cool. I think it's okay. also helpful to say directly what the benefit is to the headliner. Often they will know. So like for Philip, he wants to do these dev shop marketing briefings every month to every quarter or something like that. Sure. So Philip needs to feed the content beast with quality content and quality people who show up and do their opening act for him. Right. Other people like outreach, their goal is to convert subscribers into demos. How do I get more people off the email list and into a sales demo and actively engaged in a sales opportunity? So you're going to have to tell them why you can help them do that. Great. Josh asks, um, so is this the webinar version of guest posting? Well, so the, the way I've tried to construct the opening act idea, and you can tell me if I was successful or not, is that it can apply to any type of content, okay. right? It, it doesn't, it could be a webinar. The reason I like webinars is as a service provider, I get to demonstrate who I am. You get a sense of who I am and what it would be like to work with me or, you know, is Liston trustworthy or not? Yeah. Um, and it's up to me to fulfill <laughs> if yeah. I am. But uh, a webinar, I like the, the format because I think it emphasizes some of my personal strengths. You can do whatever you think you're best at or whatever your audience consumes. Totally up to you. Um, but guest posting is a great example. The thing that I like to do, though, when I guest post, and I'll give you another example of this. So there's a company called Milo.com for me, right? Um, there's a bunch of companies that go out and generate leads. Uh, one of them is Workshop, and I talked to Rob from Workshop yesterday. And Milo basically does the same thing. You pay some amount, um, and you get an email newsletter with leads on it. So I'm going to go to them and say, hey, what if I did a regular column once a month? And then once they say yes to that, I'll say, what if I did a webinar on this thing? Like there's tons of demand. I've done it for three other audiences, some of your competitors are featuring my content, you essentially, there's a little bit of FOMO there, right? You'd be missing out if you don't feature me. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would leverage. So guest posting, you're right. I get links back to my site. That's great. I get notoriety. I get more people reading my stuff, but I also get the opportunity to deepen my relationship, which is important. Okay, great. You know, there's something where I'm going to say I wanted to see more detail and it was, you were talking about the example of, of uh, outreach and that case study of how you, you kind of set up this relationship with them. And at one point you said, hey, do you guys do webinars? Can you kind of add some detail to how you actually handled that conversation? Because I, I think it's very easy to feel awkward when you're, you're sort of asking for more. And that's essentially what you were doing is saying, can we, you know, do you want to go on a second date? Can we get more involved here? How did you actually handle that? Can you just kind of suggest some wording or just give a little detail to how that worked? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly how it happened. So, okay. um, I, so I did the podcast with Mark mm -hmm. and then I said to Mark, Hey, I noticed you have guest posts on outreach. Who should oh, wait, I talk wait, to? Hold up, hold up, hold up. So, so this was like, you were still talking real time voice conversation. Nope. Okay, so this is over email. Up, okay. Yeah, after we hung up, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll just do a blue, blow by blow. So after okay. we hung up, I, this is what I did. I went on LinkedIn and I found that Chelsea Feldman was the head of content at Outreach. And I emailed Mark and I said, hey, I was thinking about publishing something related to getting you on the podcast about Outreach. Do you think Chelsea would be interested in content like that? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. And I said, great, can you introduce me? He introduces me to Chelsea. I write that content. And this is what I always do when I write for sites. As I'm, I say, okay, I'll give you an outline. And when I turn in the outline at the end, I go, by the way, I have this other idea for a post. So I'm keeping it moving, right? And she says, great, that sounds good. And so I turn in the first article and I said, hey, Chelsea, just curious, um, do you guys do any webinars? Because, and this is important, 
I'm sure you get lots of people subscribing to your blog who never do a demo. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, actually, this is really timely. I'm going to introduce you to Lauren. I said, great, who's Lauren? She said, well, Lauren Alt runs our webinar program. She'd love to talk to you. We really trust you with everything you've done. Mm -hmm. I said, great. So Chelsea introduces me over email to Lauren. Mm -hmm. And then I say to Lauren, hey, here's, here's the idea that we had. What does your content calendar look like? So I'm now being considerate of their own internal direction because, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are goals that they need to hit. And she said, no, that sounds perfect. Exactly what we suggested, which was how to keep a prospect's attention, get and keep mm -hmm. it. And so that's how it worked. It wasn't, um, here's what I'll say. Getting these opportunities is much easier than you think it is. Yeah. So the, th the main thing that's holding you back from getting these opportunities is not actively pursuing them. And what I've found is typically when I ask people, um, hey, I have this thing and I think it would be useful for your audience because, and it'll help you out because of this other thing, 80 to 90% of the time they say yes. Okay. Uh, um, and it's probably not because I'm so charming. Um, it's because they actually do need help. They want outside voices. Mm -hmm. They want fresh ideas. They want to give free things to their audience. And as a thinker and a service provider, you have the option of doing that. Okay. That, it sounds to me like you detailed what might be 15 or 20 discrete emails as a part of that process. Is well, that, like is that to, about right? I like to get people on the phone as fast as possible because that's... Okay. I, what I always say is business happens over the phone, not email. Yeah. So whenever I would get an introduction, mm -hmm. I would, I always take the blame for it. And I do this on LinkedIn too, to generate phone calls mm -hmm. is I'll say, you know, I have so many questions for you and there's so much I want to share that it just won't work over text. What's the best way for us to set up a phone call? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So, and they'll tell you, right. Um, send me some times, here's my calendar link, whatever it is, they'll mm -hmm. tell you how to set it up. Okay. Um, but that's what I did. So, I mean, really what we're talking about is, yeah, may, maybe around 10 emails to get to the point of having uh, the webinar agreed upon. Okay. Really appreciate you going into detail on that. Okay, I'm gonna blaze through some more questions here and try to keep making them harder and harder. How would you characterize the ROI on this type of outreach? Um, and that relates to a question Josiah just asked. He said, just to clarify, are these things sort of lost leaders? Meaning you're not getting paid to do the webinar, right? They're, they're free activities. No money directly comes from them. Um, no, no money comes direct compensation on your time. No. Okay. Um, I don't like to pursue that model personally. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's not a marketing model, right? That's, that's a fee for service model. So that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about developing your audience. Certainly there are probably ways to do that. Like, um, Philip, you and I mutually know a guy named Dan Kaplan, I think, and he got paid to write for TechCrunch. Hmm. Um, but I would argue that that audience is not focused enough to be meaningful. Um, Certainly there are reasons to do large PR pushes, but typically you won't get paid for those either. So what is the ROI? Well, it really depends on lots of things, right? How do you value your time? How long does it take you to create stuff? Mm -hmm. What's the future use of it? How often can you show it? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. Sure. Um, what I would say is it's one of the most valuable things I do. I guess my feeling is the more of this that I do, the uh, more likely it is that I'm going to develop my own audience, the more likely it is that my business is going to thrive. Let me give you a perfect example of the mistake of focusing only on ROI and expecting everything to pay off. Now, granted, you need to get some return, but uh, two days ago on Monday, I had an email appear in my email box mm -hmm. unsolicited. And it was a guy that I spoke to two years ago. And I don't even recollect the conversation. Hmm. But he referred the CEO of a company directly to me. 
um, as a client. And I asked him, how in the world did you remember me? And he said, well, I still get your emails in my inbox every day. So two things I did there, right? I steadily networked over time. And the second thing is I created content and information that kept me in front of people who would be in a position to give me business. So I don't think there's a panacea. I think in tandem, all of this stuff works together. Again, Philip does a great job of this. He has a podcast. He has content that he produces like this. He has his email list. He has different levels of engagement that you can engage with him. So it all kind of works together. Um, I think if you're going after the right audiences, I wouldn't worry about the ROI. I would worry about the execution and how you can leverage that content for the future. You know, one thing that um, it, it's a thread that's run through a couple questions. Like uh, Scott asked a question, um, like let's let's contextualize this to a freelance software developer. That's primarily Please. who I'm focused on. There's other yeah. folks here, and that's that's totally cool. You, we love you guys too. But uh, you know, th that's that's a good um, sort of litmus test or case study for where this this approach you're describing listen might be the most challenging to actually implement so think about a uh someone who does who's essentially a freelancer and has no uh what i and some other people call margin in their schedule meaning their their sort of prime directive is to monetize as many hours in the day as they can while, without killing themselves or you know right. keep their balance and keep their life in balance but they want to get paid for as many hours in the day as possible. And that, I guess that's not just a freelance software developer. That's almost anybody who thinks of themselves as a freelancer. When your business matures a bit, and I don't mean that in a like grow up and stop being childish way. I just mean that you, you're seasoned. You got some time uh, under your belt. I think right. most people start to change that mindset and they're like, this can't be all there is to it. I've got to have a way to make money that's not just me trying to maximize the number of billable hours. And it's, it feels to me like this strategy starts to become more relevant when you're across that threshold and you're figuring out ways to get paid for your expertise, not just your time. But in the context of the person who the only way they have to make money right now is to get paid for their time, do you think this is relevant or maybe they should just kind of shelve this for now and think about it later when they start figuring out ways to get paid for expertise, not time? So it depends on what you want out of your business. Okay. That, that would be my answer. So let, let me, let me, and this is what I mean by that. If what you want for your business right now is I just need as many more leads and or projects as I can get in the door. Don't do this. This is not the way to do it. Okay. Right. The way to do it is what I call the leftover strategy, which is basically taking an inventory of everybody who you know and contacting them and reforming that relationship, asking for referrals, seeing if there's projects that you can do for them, purely kind of an outbound sales model, right? That is your fastest path to get projects right now. This is not it. However, if your long-term goal is to also in tandem, and this is what I'm doing now, I'm doing both, right? I'm doing my opening act stuff where I'm showing myself and the help that I can offer to other audiences while I'm also doing the outbound stuff. And the reason I'm doing that is because I believe that in the long run, and the numbers support this, this is going to be the best way to develop more lead flow. So, you know, it really depends. If your goal is just to freelance and do as many projects as you can, um, then the opening act strategy, probably not for you, especially if you don't want to be known for a thing. Right. So the reason that this is so powerful is because it helps you sort of brand and drive awareness for what you're doing, um, which is critical. But if you don't care about that and you don't want to take a flyer and, you know, sometimes it's not going to pay off at all. I'll be totally honest with you. Right. But in the aggregate, it works. So the difference between outbound and inbound, and I'm working on this article right now, so it'll be up this week. I'd say one of the biggest differences is with inbound stuff like the opening act strategy, I get more exposure. That pays dividends over time. So I do all of the investment up front 
and I continue to get more leads from that over time and more trust. My trust radius or trust velocity, what is it? Lead, lead velocity. Trust what is your velocity. Trust, trust velocity. velocity. Like how quickly can you build trust as you're doing lead generation activities? Just as a super one quick one sentence summary of that. Go ahead. Uh, how are you generating the leads? Well, my, that's my, the thing that I'm trying to draw attention to is like, you can generate leads in a lot of ways. You know, you can be out there with a sandwich board um, like those, you know, that happens every January through April here in the U.S. There's these tax, you know, H&R Block, tax refund uh, or, you know, tax preparation places. Someone's going to be standing on the sidewalk and if it's in a city, you know, with a sandwich board. They're generating leads, but are they building trust at the same time? And what I, what I think is great about these sort of high bandwidth things like podcast guesting or doing webinars is that they can often generate trust very quickly and generate really great leads at the same time. I well, yeah, so that's, that's that exactly quick. the point I was making okay. on, on these inbound channels like the opening act strategy is whenever you get a lead coming to you through this, you've, you've already done the hard work of educating them, building your credibility, building your trust. And it pays dividends over time. So Philip is going to, you're going to post this on your website, I think, mm -hmm. yep. and it'll send traffic to me for years. Who knows yeah. how much? I don't know, but you know, it'll, it'll live there and I'll yeah. still get the benefit of it. Whereas if you're doing outbound, this leftover idea, right? I'm going to existing clients, past clients, friends and family. That only works while I'm actively doing it. And I have to do the whole process of building trust uh, building credibility while I'm talking to them. So I'm starting over from scratch every single time. Okay, cool. I'm going to keep us going through questions here. Tristan asked a really interesting one. Um, basically, do, do we kind of make one talk or one presentation or whatever and shop that around to a bunch of places or do we need to customize it for each of these people we're trying to partner with? Yeah, um, I would say if you could make only one, that would be the best thing to do. And if you could localize it slightly, which um, I, I didn't really do here, I thought because I'm talking to lots of freelancers and consultants, this would be sufficient. But if you need to localize it slightly, you should do that because it makes it more relevant. So I'll give you an example of that. So I'm gonna give a talk um, on having initial sales conversations to Rob's audience at workshop. Mm -hmm. And the way I'm going to localize it is I'm going to show the leads that he sent out that week on the webinar. And I'm going to say, let's pick two. And I'm going to demonstrate to you how I would reach out to these people and why. Right? What does that take me? An extra 10 or 15 minutes? Already, I've already done the slides. I get to do them the same. But for his audience, it becomes orders of magnitude more impactful. Right. It's much, much more relevant because it's like specific to them. Here's the key. Whenever you give a talk, you want the audience to become the hero in your story, mm -hmm. right? So if, if there are things that I can do to help them do that, to become the hero, um, I will do those things. But to answer your question directly, Tristan, having one thing and getting really good at it, especially if you're an inexperienced speaker or writer or whatever it is, um, that's a great way to do it. The only problem with that is you won't get the re, re, uh, repeatability if you only have one thing. However, you will, the work that you're saving in doing new content, you'll be spending in contacting new people and creating new relationships. I just want to add to that. So much of my thinking about marketing is influenced by the lean philosophy of software mm -hmm. development and this idea that you can start with a, a sort of very, very small prototype I think that's so relevant because the thing that most of us are fighting as solo business owners is busyness really, or is the fact that we've got to bill our, our hours to keep the wheels on. And yeah. so we're, we're sort of fighting to get just a little time each week to spend working on our business. And that's, I think another reason to start small. Um, I, I fall victim to this probably as much as anybody where you, you come across an exciting idea and you scale it up in your head and you see how amazing it could be at scale. And so you're like, well, then I must build that thing at scale. And that's my starting point. 
And I think that makes it even more difficult to actually implement. So what you said earlier, listen, about even if it's going to fail, it, I mean, it's so much like getting in shape. It's like it doesn't matter that you, you get in shape in one day. In fact, that's impossible. You, you got to get out there and walk or exercise or, you know, it's these small wins that you're trying to stack up. Yeah. Yeah. And I, just to add to the uh, lean philosophy point, because I think it's a good one. Um, what I would recommend is not, so if you wanted to do webinars and you can do whatever you want, but whatever it is, don't make it. <laughs> Come up with the idea and all you do is you email the person who you think it will help and say, hey, I have this idea to help your audience and it'll be a webinar, an article, a video, whatever it is. Um, and here's, here's the outcome that I want to help them achieve. So that may look like, um, you know, write code without wasting any time anymore, right? A process to write more effective code, whatever it is. And if they say, yeah, I'm interested, then say, great, let's set up a call, <laughs> right? Get them yeah. on the phone. And now you're pitching them an idea. You still don't have the presentation. That's fine. All you have to do is get their buy-in first on the general idea. And then the next step would just be to create an outline. This is how I do all my content. I say, okay, I'm going to send you an outline. It's not going to be done. I just want general agreement on what I'm presenting. And then they'll approve that. And then you make your presentation. Yeah. Yep. I agree. There's going to be a tension there. I just want to point out that, and the tension is, can I really do this? I'm, I'm promising something. I'm not sure that I can really pull this off. Mm -hmm. And that that, I guess I just want to say that'll go away or you'll, you'll get more comfortable with that tension over time. Um, and that learning process may involve a painful failure or two. And I would rather see people kind of lean out over their skis and crash a time or two than not um, lean into that challenge. Well, but that's, that's just my approach. Yeah. So um, you don't become a great skier without crashing right? Yeah. So if you look at the science of personal growth, and I don't want to get too woo-woo on all of you, but if you're having this doubt about yourself, you do need to know this. Growth comes in the space between comfort and absolute overstress, right? So too much stress, we can't grow because we're so concerned about surviving. Too much comfort, we're not pushing ourselves to pursue new things, try new things, and potentially fail. We need to live in between those two spaces. And that's why I'm suggesting having this kind of st stepped approach of just doing a little bit at a time and reducing your uncertainty about the person you're talking to so that you know, okay, they want this thing. They think their audience wants this thing. And you, you build it slowly over time. That takes me to the next question, which is my question, but I know people are thinking this. So in one point in your presentation, you, you said a great way when you're interacting with someone uh, in a real time, I, maybe in person, but you know, real time conversation, <laughs> Yeah. rather than saying, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You can say something like, have you ever had this problem or would yep. it be helpful if, mm -hmm. and just a reality check, how uncomfortable is it to do that the first few times? Is it easy or does it kind of make you feel awkward like you might be stumping that person and setting yourself up for an off awkward social interaction? Well, so you would ask first, well, what do you do? Okay. Right. So you can contextualize it for them because if you, you know, if, if your answer is like some complicated sort of or, you know, esoteric coding language that someone wouldn't know about, we wouldn't want to go into detail on that. We would just give them a higher level thing. Um, but yeah, it is a little bit uncomfortable first. What I would say is know your line, right? So you would have taken some time to think about how you're going to do this. So in the example that the, the way uh, Josh Braun learned this, uh, Josh said to the guy, what do you do? And the guy said, are you in sales? And Josh said, yes. Okay, so now he's verified Josh will understand any sales reference that I make. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm in sales. Okay, let me ask, answer you the question, do you manage any, anybody? Yes, I do manage people. Okay, have you ever had the problem where your cold callers are spending 90% of their days not dialing but sitting in dialing queues and uh, not getting responses on the phone? Yeah, I've had that problem. What would you say if I could 5X the number of connections you made in a day? 
he, I would say, I want to know about that. Yeah. And the guy said, get out your calendar. Right. Mm. Okay. So, I mean, there are ways to do it. Personally, I hate networking events. Um, I think it's like the most unnatural thing you could do, mm-hmm. but um, it, it's a better way than just saying, oh, you know, I sell uh, auto dialer sales software. Like that's, there's nowhere to go after that. It's like, oh, okay. Anyway. Great. Uh, Dina asks, uh, or Dina, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. This is so timely for me. I have a meeting with a gatekeeper for my audience on Friday. Because this is going to get super practical. What would be the best use of my time with her? Uh, should I ask her how to help the people I want to do business with? Or should I plan for some deliverable I could offer? My, my audience is destination marketing organizations and the tourism and hospitality businesses. So it's clear, uh, I think, to me, at least at this level, that uh, there's positioning is in place. Like that part is the big green check mark there. Mm-hmm. So uh, what do you think about that question? Yeah, I would, um, my approach would be to find out, um, like what actually, can you tell me the, the context of the call? Like, what are they expecting in this call? Yeah. And, and uh, Dinah, Dean, I don't, I don't know if it's convenient for you to unmute and, uh, give us some more detail. Yeah, if you could if jump is, on, awesome. I'd love to, um, actually help you with this live. Yeah. No worries if not, but, uh. Well, I'll just go ahead and answer it. And if she can jump on, then um, she can jump in. Um, Yeah. So my approach would always be to ask, um, you know, who, who are you serving? Um, I think it's so-and-so. Is that right? Are there any other audiences that you have? Um, And I would ask them, you know, what do they care about? And then a follow-up question to that is, what are you trying to give them right now? Like what are the weak points in your content or what are the things you really want to help them with? And then I would come up with an idea or two and say, here's how I think I can help them. How does that sound? And so all the whole goal of that call is only to get conceptual agreement. It's not to determine exactly what's going to be in the presentation or what, you know, I I would say, if it's going to be a webinar, there's marketing that needs to happen to get people there. Um, if it's an article, there's less pressure to figure out exactly all the details. But um, yeah, I think really it's about conceptual agreement on how you can help them and what you can offer. And so you're on a fact finding mission primarily. Awesome. Uh, Dave asks, I have a reasonably sized audience, but I'm having a difficult time deciding how I can help them in a way I can sell. I'm giving away my audio content right now. I want to identify how I can help them in ways I can monetize. Tips for finding that out. That may relate very directly to what you just said, but uh, that was Dave's question. Yeah, um, having a difficult time deciding how I can help them. So Dave, what I would suggest you do is actually talk to people like you're, you're going to hear me. I'm a broken record on this one. Um, the more you can talk to people, they'll tell you what they need. They'll tell you what kind of problems they're having. And I would ask a question like, Hey, just curious. Um, what do you get out of my podcast? Like, why do you tune into it? Right. Or whatever audit, I don't know the form of your audio, but I would ask them what they're struggling with. Why is it they tune into you? And then I think you'll have a pretty clear idea of where they need help. And the more of these conversations you have, uh, the more likely you are to be able to answer that question. I know that's not, it doesn't feel like a formula um, because there's an art to it also. But what you wanna do is start collecting feedback and pick up on what are those themes that you're hearing. That's a tough question, man. That's like one of the essential questions of business is like, what should I make? So yeah. that's a hard one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, do, do, can you see Michael's question there, Liston? Um, yeah. When I okay. spoke to the people at the National Kitchen and Bath Association, I told them I was looking to create products and or services that I can help their members. And in doing so, I would like to do some research. I asked if they knew any of their members that would be helpful and open to assisting me with my research. They love the approach. In fact, the two chapters... I spoke to would like me to create presentations for their members. Is that what you're referring to, Philip? I don't see a question in there. 
Oh, no, I, actually, now that I now that you read that, I was just doing some kind of um, collecting questions that we haven't answered yet. Uh, I think that was Michael saying this stuff really works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it does. <laughs> or, 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 you know, or saying these opportunities are out there. Um, they're, you know, like a lot, a lot, some of the examples you used might feel a little bit foreign to folks who are um, you know, kind of more in the trenches in terms of just building things. But there is very likely some, if, if you have the positioning thing figured out, and I, I know I sound like a broken record when I say that, I don't think any of this stuff is, is usable advice unless you have a, a, some kind of target, like right. some kind of like, who am I trying to reach? Right. And once you, once you answer that question, like if I could just, if I knew I was going to be hit by a bus tomorrow and I wanted to leave a question for the world to answer for their business, that would be the question. Who do you serve? So once you answer that, then you can start to connect the dots and say, oh, there's this, you know, really, you know, this is association of forklift drivers, <laughs> and you know, I want to reach them. Right. And it's, it, I mean, those might be your buyers. Yeah. And uh, I, I, Michael also added another comment, pick up a phone. Um, so I wanted to add to that in case anyone here doesn't know, Philip and I have a podcast together called offline podcast.rocks. And um, we actually just recorded an episode on this very topic, which is, uh, is it possible to build your service business without talking to other human beings? And the short answer is not really a good one. Um, I, and I know, I mean, I used to be one of these, like more on this side of things. Yeah. There are people who want the answer to that question to be yes. And I, I just am not sure at all <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that it can be a yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't know. And it, I think you, you just have to give yourself permission that some people will say no, and that's totally okay. Right. On to the next. There's, there's someone in the world who needs your help. Yeah. What else okay. we got? Well, um, I have some questions that I, uh, cooked up. Uh, I was curious about <laughs> like for you to dive into more detail on competing against Molly and, uh, Neil or uh -huh. Nile. But um, I do want to just, uh, we've got five minutes left and I'd rather make sure that we haven't glossed over anybody's question or if someone has a follow-up or just something else, um, I'd really like to uh, make sure we have time to dive into that. So I'm just going to pause for 15 seconds or so and, you know, now or never. Cue Jeopardy theme. also want to say that you guys have been awesome. This has been like some of the super, super interesting questions coming from you. Well, let's do a quick lightning round then. Um, so you mentioned competing against, you know, Molly, uh, people may not know who that is, but basically someone who commands a massive audience and a massive advertising budget. Why is that hard? If yeah, I'm out there well, trying to create content and, and earn the attention of people, why is it hard to compete against Molly? Yeah, I think that the, the short answer, there's two answers to that. One is her only job is to market, right? And get her content noticed. Mm -hmm. And the second answer is she has a tremendous amount of resources. Remember that picture of the tug of war, right? She has, she has a team of strapping dudes pulling on her side of the rope and you know, it's just you on the other side. And so if you could, it would make a lot more sense to go to Molly and say, you should feature my content rather than try to outcompete her. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the short answer. Great. She, she's got this, you know, if you think about a musician and a stage, she's got this stage with the Rolling Stones on it and you're just a guy with a guitar, right? <laughs> or a gal with right. a guitar. Right, um, exactly. Okay, can you give an example of an audience or group that's not based on an identity, a horizontal position, or a vertical position? That's something you touched on real briefly, and I wanted a bit more detail. Yeah, well, so the, the example that I gave in the um, presentation is TEDx speakers, right? Mm -hmm. They don't self-organize at all. So, you know, if you wanted to, you know, let's, let's say your audience was um, uh, stay-at-home moms, who do, uh, you know, extensive spackling work in bathrooms. Like, how are you mm -hmm. going to find that group of people? 
Uh It's too uh specific, right? So you would figure out, well, where do moms, stay-at-home moms learn about home repair or home improvement, Mm -hmm. right? So you would kind of go a step above because those people don't self-organize in any way. Um, whereas, you know, for me, like freelancers and consultants, it is an identity and there are places or people who are already targeting that market that I can access. Um, right. Yeah. So there's like sort of, you know, Amy Hoy calls it watering holes, places they might gather online. And that, that may right. not be the sole focus of that gather that watering hole. There's tools they use, right? There's associations they might be part of where, again, it's not the sole purpose of the association, but um, the the right kind of people are there. Well, and, and the identity also may be temporary. So I'll give you an example of that home buyers, right? Who doesn't yeah. want access to home buyers or home sellers, but you're not a home buyer or a home seller seller forever. So I have a friend who does home inspections and you know, his long-term strategy would be to get more SEO traffic. So he comes up in local searches anytime someone's looking for a home inspector. His short-term strategy has to be go to, to go to realtors because they know who today's home buyers and home sellers are. Um, but those folks aren't self-organizing except maybe on house.com or Redfin maybe, but you know, a lot of noise there and you're not gonna be able to do any kind of opening act for them. Okay. Listen, thank you, thank you, thank you. Remind folks where they can get this guide that kind of gives them specific next step. Yeah, so uh, I want to give you uh, two options to follow up with me. One is this listen.io slash opening act. So I think it's like a six or seven page um, companion workbook. That it goes along with the article that you can read. Um, so if you subscribe to that, you'll get a link to the article. Um, and you can go through that and go through the workbook. And if you wanted to talk to me about sales coaching or sales training, uh, just go to listen.io slash talk and you can grab me there. Okay. Well, that's listen. it, Philip. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody who's here who contributed such great questions. Uh, there'll be a recording of this on my website afterwards, uh, just in, under the resources section. And uh, I'll see you all around online. I'm just going to hang up and in, in the meeting and, we can connect later. Bye for now, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.